Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part two of our series with Roger Whitney, host of the Retirement Answer Man podcast and founder of The Rock Retirement Club. So, Roger, I have to tell you that after our first video that we filmed last time for the first part of our series, I had to go and get my mom and tell her she has to watch this and she has to listen to it because she's exactly what you were talking about, which was somebody who has been a saver her whole life and now is having trouble tapping into this money and enjoying the money that she has put away in retirement. So um, she will be watching this whole series. Yay. (laughs) I'm excited to have her watch everything you have to say too about this next part where we're going to be talking about how to build an income strategy for your spending in retirement. So Roger, how about if you kick that off for us with what are the must have assets when you do retirement planning? Well, it's really the must have assets are the assets that you have. I mean, you know, by this point, there's not a lot you can do. You have what you have. So it's figuring out what is feasible, right? What is a feasible roadmap to create this kind of life? And in my, I, my suggestion is probably the must have asset is to have a process to be able to think about things in an organized fashion. Yeah. Because with retirement planning, there's a couple of things you got to understand. Number one is nobody knows how to do it. The modern retirement hasn't been done before with how long you're going to live, the risks that you have to face, the fact that most, many people don't have pensions, or if they do have pensions, it doesn't cover everything. Uh, how active you want to be, where you're going to be involved in the playground of life, not on the park bench like our grandparents were. So nobody actually knows how to do this. And that's scary, but what that means is, is that a process so you can think about things in an organized fashion is so critical. So if we think about once you've identified your spending, to your question, Danielle, is okay, what resources do you, what assets? Well, you're going to pay for your retirement with three main assets, okay? The first asset in the finance world we call social capital. So this is... Social security is a great example. It's a socialized guaranteed income payment that you won't outlive. So we, most of us have social capital in, the term, in terms of social security, and perhaps you have a pension that would be considered there. So those are guaranteed payments that are gonna offset your spending. The next asset is human capital, your ability to earn an income, because I'm, a good percentage of people that retire end up earning some kind of income, not some because they have to, but some just because it's a byproduct of them exploring things that they love to do and that are valued in the marketplace. And then the last asset is your financial capital. And that's the one we normally think of, which is your money, right? Your investments, your 401k and everything else. And so those are the, you need to have those organized to know what you have to try to match the spending that you want to do. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so when we think about the traditional income sources that you might have during retirement, uh, some of that is kind of in that first bucket that you mentioned, right? We're going to have a social security check and we're going to potentially have a pension. Of course, we don't see those as often as we used to in the past. And what else? And then you're going to, well, you could buy deferred income annuities. Annuities Mm -hmm. are a way of buying a pension in in terms of social capital. Um. But what you want to know is how much of your spending is going to be covered by these income sources that are going to turn on during that phase of life, because then that will help us identify what the gap is. If you need to spend $100,000 a year to live your core lifestyle, let's say, but you only have $50,000 a year in income coming in from human and social capital, well, we have a gap. Mm -hmm. We have $15,000 a year as a gap that's going to have to come from your actual money, right? Your investment assets and your, and your savings accounts. Um, and that's really important to understand because here's the thing, Danielle. We think of this as spending, but what it really is, is every year, let's assume it's $50,000 you need from your investment assets that aren't covered by income. That's a debt. Right. And so in year one of retirement, that's a debt and you have to pay that debt off. And that debt is the money you need for your consumption to live your life. And then in year two, you have another debt. It's like you owe somebody money. The person just happens to be you. (laughs) 
And year two, you owe yourself another $50,000. And then in year three, year four. So those are all I owe me's, I call them. And so you have to figure out, well, wow, I, have, I owe this money. If you owed somebody money, you would make sure you had the money available to pay it. The difference is you're paying yourself and that helps you figure out, okay, I'm going to take this big pot of money I have here. How do I sequence out so I can make sure those debts are paid so you can live the kind of life that you want? Yeah, so that you have an income stream that you depend on, kind of like you have your whole working life, right? Because we're used to having this paycheck and we know what's coming in and then we know what's going to be going out. And so these are all things that we need to plan for the same way in retirement. It's just you're paying it to a different place, which is yourself. Right. And we think of, you know, traditionally in retirement planning, it was we need to take our assets and create income off of it, buying, you know, dividend stocks or bonds and things like that. The problem is that was the old type of retirement and it worked because people worked, didn't live as long after retirement, interest rates were higher, and they lived much more modest lifestyles. So in the modern retirement, which is what everybody here is going to live, they're going to live a lot longer than anybody in the history of the world in retirement. They're going to be healthier and more active than anybody in the world in the history of retirement. And interest rates are so low that you can't generate the kind of income. Mm. So we need to rethink how we think of this. And because you're actually going to end up having to access mom, you're going to actually have to take some of your money and spend it. Yeah. And one, when I think one, someone pointed this out to me the other day, Daniel, and I think it's healthy. Because if we have a, say, a 401k and it's worth whatever, a million dollars, when if we need to pay ourselves $50,000, we feel like we're selling and taking money away from us, right? Yeah. And that's scary. But I think there's some, there's a, if you think of it slightly differently, what is that million dollars? That million dollars is actually deferred income. It's income that you've earned that you chose to defer in order to realize the income later on. And you had the blessing, hopefully, of the income growing over time through returns. So when you take that $50,000 in this example from your 401k, you're not spending your money. You're just receiving income that you had deferred and decided to take now. Oh, I love and that. And sometimes that helps us understand it a little bit more mm -hmm. um, and, and gives us a little bit more permission. So as you're creating this withdrawal strategy, we have to map out and I can share how I map out. How do you pay these debts? and still take care of inflation later on. And so when people are building withdrawal strategies, I imagine that those are going to be different as different as the person and the Definitely. things that they enjoy. Definitely. The baseline withdrawal strategy that I would suggest, so this would be what I'd call true north, that you're going to adjust based on your individual situation. So when I have someone that's transitioning into retirement, you're going to take all of your assets and you're basically going to divide it between three or four buckets. Uh, the first is a contingency fund, right? We can call that an emergency fund plus some buffer of money because you're going through this major life change. I think that's always one. Smart. And then the second layer is what I call an income floor. So with, with what I would suggest is, and this is what we teach in our course in the club, is map out how much you need for the first five years of retirement. So let's take the $50,000 a year. And we assume we need $50,000 a year from our money for the first five years of retirement. So five times five is $250,000. So at the beginning of retirement, we take $250,000 in this example, and we invest that in what we call an income floor. And we're buying CDs, individual bonds, something that is super safe, that will mature right around the time that we need it. Because we owe that debt and that money better be there to pay the debt. And we don't want it to be at risk in the markets, which is the short-term risk, right? If it's invested in the markets go down and- oh, Of I course. Money. So we map out pre-funding the first five years of retirement. And then the next layer is going to be more of a longer term portfolio. And then a layer above that would be really aggressive, more like investing like a 45-year-old. That's really money that you need at you know, age 80 or 85. And so what you've created here with your assets is 
you've created a time segmented allocation. So you have multiple allocations that are different at each layer that correspond with the time when you're going to need it. Because the hard part with retirement when you're allocating money is, we'll go back to that seesaw example that we talked about last week. When you're retiring, you have two major risks when it comes to allocating your money. On the short term, you have, you know, we call it sequence of return risk, which is basically the markets go down right after I retire. And now you're really yeah. hurting because you're invested. And then on the other end of the seesaw, you have inflation, which will eat away. And what you solve for with inflation doesn't help you with sequence of return. And so again, we're straddling that seesaw. Mm -hmm. So by building this out, you know, this, I call it a pie cake structure, you enter retirement knowing exactly how the first five years of life are going to be funded. And then the monies that are invested are invested where you have a very good odds of having a good experience, even if the markets crash in day one of retirement. Uh, and so that's how I, I, I think through approaching it. Yeah. And I love that. And I think that when people put a plan together like that, it just provides so much peace of mind and less anxiety when you're heading through it. The same way that with our clientele here, we see the people who've been studying Medicare since they turned 62 and they come in knowing everything ahead of time versus the ones that are calling me the day before they turn 65 and have no clue about Medicare at all. And that anxiety level is so much higher. So putting together a plan like you're talking about, um, I think that's probably when I attended your event a couple of years ago that you did for your retirement club members in the fall. There was a lot of energy in that room and people were excited about being there and they were really excited to share with each other in the club exactly how they were going through this and the stage that they were at. And it was kind of like almost a little bit of a roadmap for them uh, and, and also an opportunity to be with other people that were going through it at the same time. And I think that's, important because we feel like we're by ourselves yeah. right? and not having, it's, you know, harder to talk to the neighbor or your sister or brother about these types of things. Cause they're not going through the same thing and the relationship's different. And I think, you know, that what we talked about last week and what we just talked about are really big and foundational rocks in building your retirement plan. And what I have found, I'm guessing you find this with Medicare as well, the problem is when we go out on the internet and read articles, whether it's blogs or other videos or things like that, generally people gravitate towards what I call the financial bling of planning, right? All the fancy cool stuff that we, you know, that are talked about that will optimize it <laughs> um, because it's in, more interesting and it sounds like a simple bullet. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I think, the optimization part when it comes to tax planning and Medicare and everything else are really important, but you have to go through having a feasible plan that is resilient. Then you can add on the bling, right? First, I want to make sure the car will get down the road <laughs> and that I have a seatbelt and enough gas. Then I can figure out, you know, what options I want to throw in the car afterwards. And so sometimes we do it in reverse, unfortunately. Yeah. And you make a good point too, because there, we always hear about the kind of the loneliness of retirement and there's many reasons for that, but I never thought of what you just said, which is that this is not something that you can put together and just talk with the mailman about. Like we're talking about very serious personal things like money. And so when everyone in your life that's younger than 65 isn't going through that, you don't have very many sources to share ideas and concerns and frustrations and anxieties with that. There's not always a good outlet for that. Yeah. And the perspective, and you have to find people that are in the same stage of life and very much like you. Uh, and it, it goes back to like the advice that you might get from someone that has a huge pension and lives very modestly Well, they have a very, and you have no pension and you have aspirational things. Well, their viewpoint isn't going to be as, you know, whatever recommendations they give is from their reality. And if you have a huge pension and you know you're going to receive an inheritance, well, yeah, I might have a different view in the world than like I am. I don't have a pension. I'm not going to receive an inheritance. I have different issues. Mm -hmm. So that, that doesn't speak near as much to me. So you got to figure out how do you have a safe place to have these kind of discussions. 
Yeah. And I wonder if some of that's what led you to form the Rocky Retirement Club, because then people would have an opportunity to not only learn from you and exchange ideas, but maybe to find other people in that group who are right at that same stage of the journey. Considering how long we live these days, that that journey can be quite a while. What a great opportunity for people to come together and find some some other people like them to have someone to talk to about all of this. Exactly. And and learn from somebody that's a little bit ahead of you on the trail, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can't wait to learn more about that. Folks, we're going to talk all about that in our next part of the series. And we'll be covering what is the benefit of a retirement club. And first of all, what is a retirement club? And Roger's going to come back and join us and share all of that wisdom with us and let you know what it's all about. So Roger Whitney, host of the Retirement Answer Man podcast and founder of the Rock Retirement Club. Thank you so much for joining us here today. And I'll see you next week. All righty.